Welcome, everybody, to the Black Belt Barber podcast, the first and only podcast about entrepreneurship for barbers and professionals of our beauty industry. I'm Tico. I'm your host. And here today, we have a special guest, Gene. Uh, but before we start, just follow me, Tico Invictus. And we have an amazing story here. We have someone that we're going to be talking about real estate. Uh, we're going to be learning here for an hour how we invest as a barber also. So, Gene, can you share your story? Can you share who you are? Sure, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me on this podcast. I'm honored. Like I mentioned before, this is my first podcast. And, you know, I'm always listening to podcasts and I'm like, I don't know if I would be able to do that, you know. But here I am, you know. There's a first time for everything. And if you can believe it, you can achieve it. So a little bit about myself. I'm from New York. I was born in Queens, Jackson Heights. I am 31 years old. I my birthday's this month on April 16th, so I'm gonna be going to Top Golf. My first time there. I'm trying to learn how to play golf. When are you going? Uh, on the 16th, Saturday. 16th, okay. Yeah, with my family. And um, I got into real estate in 2013. Um, that was pretty much already after the recession. Um, people were starting to start investing in real estate again, and me being 23, 22. Um, it was very, it was an uphill battle. Um, a lot of people didn't want to work with someone. How long, they always ask, how long have you been in real estate? You know, how many properties have you sold? What's your track record? Uh, I was also driving a beat up old, uh, Nissan Pathfinder 2001. I remember showing up to a property. Um, the guy was driving a Maserati. He looked, he looked at me when he got the car and then he looked at the car and he shook his head. You already know that was the last time he worked with me. Um, so that just shows the psychology of real estate and being successful um, in my industry. Uh, the type of people that you work with uh, looks does matter and what you drive does matter, unfortunately. Um, so in, in regards to my in, t in regards to my success uh, today, um, from that point on, I started to really look at how I run my business, uh, how I work with my clients. And from there, it was history. I believe yeah. it's uh, the way you dress up, what you drive, the mm -hmm. way you talk. Yeah, it's a it's a way of communication, verbal, non-verbal. So that mm -hmm. means that means a lot what people, how people look at you, and they how they react. Absolutely, and I say all the time that your first impressions are usually your last impressions. Um, if you're not clean, if you're not well spoken, if you don't know what you're talking about, they're going to already judge you before they even speak to you and unfortunately that's the real reality of the world is you know they they look at you they have that first look on you and then they start judging you right away you don't want that to happen but it's the reality that we live in and you have to be prepared for that before um i can tell you very successful before you being who you are today what are those struggles and what did you done what you have done to become who you are um there's a lot of lessons involved with failures. Um, I failed more times than I became than I was successful. Uh, when I started in real estate, before real estate, I was in call centers, I was in banks. And um, I decided when I got into real estate that I was going to be in control of my own destiny, I was going to be in control of how much I make. But that's also a double edged sword because uh, you're, you don't have the security. You're jumping into something full time. You're not sure how much you're going to make. Um, and you're not really sure how far you're going to go. When you're getting a paycheck, for example, at a bank, I was getting like $12 an hour. And I was jumping from being a banker to a teller. I was being told what to do. I was there all day, working 40 hours a week, and I was getting $400 a week. And I decided, like, you know, my time is worth more than this. So a realtor showed up into the bank while I was working there. And he deposited three checks. I remember them clearly. 40,000, 60,000, and 96,000. All at the same time. And I'm like, what the hell? Did you just sell a house, like your own house? And I'm like, this is a commission from my deals. And I looked at his shirt, it said Remax. Um, from there, um, I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing here? Like, my, I'm wasting my time, my life. These people are so hard on me, telling me what to do, make calls, make do this, do that for $12 an hour, I can be doing a lot more for my time. And that's when I got my real estate license. I studied, I studied, 
Um, the good thing about that is that once I did get my license, I picked up a client at the bank and that was my first deal. Um, that was the most money I ever made in one shot. It was $9,000 and six months later I spent it all. <laughs> I spent it all on partying, on, <laughs> on buying clothes, on stupid stuff, you know? And then- So you were 20? I was 23. 23 at yeah. that time. And six months later I was broke. Um, I got into a really dark space, you know, I was really depressed because when you make that amount at that age in one shot, more money than you've ever seen in your bank account, the most I had before that was 4,000 and I spent like two years saving that up. Um, it's, it's a big high. It's like dopamine when you get, when you get like a check for 10, 10, $15,000 is dopamine. And it's like having a drug inside of you. You're so stimulated that when you don't have that anymore, you don't know what to do with it. You don't know what to do um, after that. So I didn't have anything else. I had no deals in my pipeline. I had nothing. And from there, um, I got into a really dark space. You know, I was very depressed. I was actually having suicidal thoughts. Um, and then I joined a, a company and my friend, um, I did an open house for him and he recommended me to someone. He said that someone needed a team member on their team. And that person was the person, the person who needed a team was the person who walked in that bank that day. Uh, coincidentally, they wow. were friends. It wasn't coincidence for me, it was. Yeah, so I'm like, be. so I joined his team as his buyer's agent. Um, and from there, that's when my career really started um, as far as the stability, the security that I got. He supplied me with leads. Um, and that year working with him, I made 60 grand, which was the most I ever made in my, in my life at that point. And, um, uh, I was so grateful and, you know, I call him up and I say, Hey, listen, like, I'm so great till this day. I'm so grateful for, for you helping me out. You don't know where I was when you, when you, um, added me to your team. And, um, till this day, I'm very grateful that happened. It yeah. was the jump start for you. Something really really i i always talk about this you have to become the millionaire because if you're not the millionaire yet the mon all the money that, that you're going to earn you're going to spend mm -hmm. you have to become uh, the success successful business owner because yeah. if you don't become that person you also can lose everything just the way you lost nine thousand dollars because you haven't become the person to know how uh, administrate. Mm -hmm. You may oh, have a millionaire mindset, even become, if you're not a millionaire. Yeah. Like in your head, you should be a millionaire already. That's what you mean? Not just in the head. The actions. Become that person. Mm -hmm. Because I know many people that become a millionaire three or four times, not become. I mean, they, they got rich, mm -hmm. wealth, but they didn't become the wealth person. Yeah. And then they lost everything. So it's they got rich. Like a mindset, it, yeah. right? Yeah. And actions and how you behave. How you behave. One habits. thing that is interesting about your story, the <laughs> person that actually inspired you, that went to... See? I don't believe yeah. in coincidences. Mm -hmm. I believe in God. Like the person that went there and deposited those checks and you're like, what the hell am I doing with my life? They're mm -hmm. making money and I'm here making $12 an hour. Yeah. And then that person inspired you to go to real estate and a few years later you're yep. there working with that person that's amazing absolutely and i grew up in uh, pretty much a my, my entire family um on like my father's side they're very business savvy so i've always felt like i had that spirit that intuition on on how to run a business but i never really uh like dove deep into it my father he has been an investor uh since we moved to florida his family uh in dr they have businesses over there and stuff like that. So I kind of, I kind of was raised in that type of environment. But me being a kid, wanting to be a kid, I was stupid with my money. But that failure is what taught me how to run a business. And joining him on on his team, he showed me the ropes on how to run his business. He showed me how he ran he ran his business, and that opened up my eyes. And I'm like, you have to spend money to make money, in most cases. Yeah, I think most cases are spending money, energy, spend mm -hmm. all your time first to become mm -hmm. that person that you like to be in the future, to live the life you want to live. Mm -hmm. But question, when you officially started working in real estate, so you had one deal, 
you got nine thousand dollars and then for months you got nothing how was uh when you start working for this company you said you made sixty thousand in one year mm -hmm. sometimes real estate agents they have this uncertainty they don't know how much money they will make and i would say it's similar to barbers in the beginning of their career because they don't have clientele they don't know how much they're gonna make and it takes time to build a client. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's very similar in that sense. So were you afraid, like, what if I don't make any money? Yeah, so of course I was afraid. I didn't want to go back to a nine to five job. That was my biggest depression. That was the cause of my depression. Going from making 9,000 off of one deal with not that much effort to going back to nine to five, being in jail pretty much, making you know pennies on a dollar. So the way that what I tell people, especially agents who are trying to get in the business, is join a team or join a company, join a brokerage that is going to supply you with these deals. Even if you take a hit on commission split, uh, it's going to get the ball rolling and it's going to build your database. Oh uh, and God. that database. It's going to build your network. Yeah. See how interesting is this, what he's saying? How you can relate with the barbers? He said, join a company. Mm -hmm. Sometimes barbers start their career and they jump into a suite where they rent the space, but they don't have the clientele. Mm -hmm. And usually a barber shop has the whole structure. It has already clients, walk-ins. So it's much easier for you to build your clientele if you join a barber shop instead of trying right on the, the first tryout when you finish school going by yourself. It's much harder. Yeah, and, and absolutely. As a barber, when you start at, the, at a shop, when you start your career at a shop, it's good because you get exposure. They're gonna promote them, and also you're gonna get clients because they are there in that same location for for a while. So mm -hmm. we all that's relate. And on top of that, they're getting experience, experience while they're doing also. that. Yeah, and that's the most important thing because experience then drives more clientele organically in the future. Um, absolutely, I agree. Yeah. What is uh, your expertise? Um, renting. Uh, what was the Commercial, or what was the what's the other one? residential residential yeah, residential yeah. and commercial? What what is your your expertise? My expertise is residential. Uh, when I started real estate, it was more like Coral Springs, uh, Boca Raton, Parkland, Coconut Creek. Um, so here's here's pretty much the timeline. So after I joined his team, one year later, May sixty thousand, decided that I was. Uh, well off to start doing it on my own so i ended up going to another remax and started doing it my own started cold calling i was calling expired leads i was calling for sell by owners i was posting on facebook instagram everything trying to do everything organic and get in the nitty-gritty of learning the business and doing postcards uh, fast forward uh, three years later i opened up my own brokerage uh, 2017 with a business partner. I did that for three years. Uh, we actually converted that into a investment firm. So we have capital in there that we look for investment opportunities. Um, after that, I opened up my second brokerage and uh, that, that was called Atlas Realty. Uh, I grew that to a team of 20 agents. And then just recently, I decided that I wanted to break into a different market. I wanted to break into the luxury market, the investment market, because most of my clientele was investors. Uh, they were buying second homes, they were buying vacation homes, they were buying rental properties. And I decided that if I wanted to increase my income and put in the same amount of effort, I needed to increase my sales value, my sales price. So for example, uh, you can sell properties at 300,000 and uh, at a commission of 3%, that's nine grand, right? Uh, in order to make 90,000, you have to sell 10 of those properties. Right. Um, if you wanted to make a million, you would have to sell a hundred of those properties. Right. So I decided, why don't I just increase my sales price by three times and I'll have to do less transactions. I have to deal with less clients and I'll take less of my time. So instead of doing three hundred thousand dollar properties, uh, which I still do, obviously, you know, I don't turn down business. Right. Um, I, I increased my sales volume by going to Fort Lauderdale. So I've been focusing heavily on Fort Lauderdale because the sales price is, the average there is 1.2 million. Okay. Anything else? Oh, no, that one? Yeah, uh, go ahead. I was going to say I cut you off because uh, some really interesting came to my mind about mm -hmm. uh, investors. So since you deal with a lot of investors, let's say 
a barber, right? Mm-hmm. He works for someone behind the chair, rent the chair, he works at a shop, and he's looking for an investor. What does step he could do it? What what does he need to do it to be able to find this right person mm-hmm. to invest in him? What does he have to do it? So invest in him in him how? Like how to I mean invest in? if okay, I didn't explain No, uh, go ahead. Your, yeah. Like uh, for example, he wants to open his first shop and then grow to like a franchise. Mm-hmm. So how that works? So first, obviously, you need to have a book of business. You need to have enough traffic, enough um, a big enough database to 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 flow, right? Um, you need to have experience. You need to be able to have enough self development to be a leader. Uh, if you don't have those, um, if you don't have those features, I guess, or the characteristics, you need to start working on them, sharpen them, because even if you do open up a shop or a brokerage or whatever, a firm, um, you're not going to be able to retain your employees or retain your team because they're not going to like working with you. They're not going to like the energy and environment is huge when you when you deal with a barbershop. If you can't vibe with your barbers, um, you know, it's going to be bad energy and it's going to fall on the clientele. They're going to feel that and they're going to see that and you're not going to be able to grow a franchise from there. So definitely work on yourself before you do that. Um, after that, I, I think that finding a good location with foot traffic is very important. Um, find the location with an anchor spot. An anchor spot meaning a Publix, a supermarket, or a major shopping center. Oh, that's what they call anchor spot? Yeah, so like an anchor is the, the one that's pretty much bringing everything together and bringing all the foot traffic. For example, um, I don't know if I can mention this, but my cousin opened up a barbershop in Coral Springs, and he opened the one up in next to Publix in uh, Coral Springs, and that has been driving so much traffic to his to his uh, to his space that he's he needs more barbers. So, for example, he, has, he probably has a full capacity right now with barbers, but those barbers, especially if you're new, you're getting that foot traffic. People who walk in, there's still there's people waiting there, and you're getting that constant um, that constant flow of cash flow into your into your business and not only that you're getting that cash flow you're getting that maybe repeat business that that's how you build your book of business that repeat business is your business your referrals me and my wife we did a mistake that we we were wasn't pre- prepared to mm-hmm. open up our own our first, first shop first business we didn't look at none of that mm-hmm. yes it's it was just, luck right it was god we're successful right now because we strive a lot so, but now I have a different mindset. Mm-hmm. I do everything you just said. Yeah. What are, what are, what about the investor? What they are looking for in a barber? Let's say, given the same example, what they, what the documents they are looking for? What the uh, proofs they are looking for to invest in a barber? So for, for example. So let me see if I can if I if I got your question right. Um, what is a a leasing company? Let, let's say or a I'm an investor, right? Um, I want to invest in a barber. Oh, you so want to invest in a barbershop? In a barbershop. Okay. A barber that wants to open a, a, mm-hmm. a, a barbershop or a barbershop that is, is already going and successful. What mm-hmm. I'm, what, if I'm an investor, what I'm looking for? If I'm an investor, I'm going to put it in my shoes. If I'm an investor, I'm looking for a barbershop that has a following, that has a good book of business, who can show me their P&L statements, that is organized enough to show me their P&L statements. And P&L meaning your profit and loss, you know, what are your expenses compared to what are your profits? Um, You have to learn how to itemize your profits and losses. If you want to be a business owner, you need to know these terms. You know, what are your, what's your profit? What's your losses? You need to be able to know uh, what's your retention rate? You know, exactly uh, how many clients are you keeping? How many clients are dropping off? You know, and you have to know why they're dropping off. What's your marketing like? Are you marketing yourself? Uh, And then after that, it's basically location. Is the location going to be able to uh, amplify the business um, or, or is the location how much is the location compared to how much the business can make what's my profit going to be like uh, what's my return on investment is it even going to be worth it to invest in you or the business if my expenses are going to be too close or too high uh, too close to the profit like my margins need to be there I have two observations about what you said one was is your cousin right that opened a mm-hmm. shop okay uh, I've seen some uh plazas where they have two barber shops mm-hmm. and i think that's the mistake of the first one that rented that made the lease agreement where they didn't put the clause where you couldn't have another barber shop in the same plaza because this is not good luckily 
at the time we did our signing, we had an attorney like reviewing the whole lease mm -hmm. and he instructed us in that, like mm -hmm. you have to have this clause. Otherwise you can have two, three barber shops here competing in the same plaza. That's not good for you. And I've seen plazas where they have two, three business in the same industry, which is not good. So it's something we should really be careful when Absolutely. we're signing the lease. Yeah. And the second thing you said that I can um, relate in the barber world is you said you decided to change instead of selling homes around the 300,000 and make a lot of effort, more effort to make 1 million or whatever was your goal, you decided, okay, so I will invest in homes that are worth more. So I make less transactions and be able to reach my goal. Barbers can do the same depending on how much they charge uh, per service, right? Per haircut or mm -hmm. beard or whatever services they are offering. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I think is really important, before you did that, you had some years of experience first. Mm -hmm. So if a barber is starting, they can just start charging $100 a haircut. There is no mm -hmm. sense on that. They have a, a path they should go, gain experience, master their craft, know what they're doing, mm -hmm. market themselves, and then they can do the same instead of serving 20 clients a day at $20 to make 200 Mm -hmm. They can charge $50 and serve four clients a day. But yeah, there yeah. is a path, right? Until you got there. You just don't jump and now I'm going to sell million dollar houses. Absolutely. And it's like my barber, my cousin, right? Uh, Marvin. He He's the only barber that I trust. And it's very... Let, let me, quick question. Marvin's not the one that say barbers. He's not the one, right? No, he's Marvin. very, he's low key. Oh, yeah. he's low key. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, He's, he's the only barber that I go to. And when he's booked out, I get so frustrated because it's your haircut is your image most of the time. And um, I just don't trust anyone else with my hair. If I do go to someone else, they're going to just tape me up. They're going to they're gonna shape me up, and that's all I, I'm going to let them do. I'm not going to let them use scissors on my head. Because he knows what I want. You know, when you when you deal with that barber, and he, he tailors his his style to you and you tailor your style to him and you sit on that chair and he doesn't even ask you like what do you want today he's like he already knows unless you mention something um, and that's the beautiful thing about building that trust and that that clientele because once you have a client it's mostly for life unless they move somewhere else or whatever and that fear that client has if they're moving is like damn what am I gonna do with my new barber like you know that that goes to people's mind like now that you need a haircut I was going to my to my guy. Now I have to look for a new barber, and it's it's so scary. And that goes with anything in business. Um, when you build that trust and brand recognition, and the quality of work is consistent, nobody would go anywhere else. And I think people would pay uh, the extra money to for that. And that comes with experience. Um, originally, when I first started getting haircuts, it was sixteen dollars, right? Sixteen dollars. I was going to this old Puerto Rican guy. Uh, my father was getting his haircut by him. And it kept going up from there, 16 to 18 to 20 to 25. And I was like 35. And I'm like, I'll pay, you know, I'll still pay because I know that when I walk out of that place, I'm going to have the haircut that I want and I'm going to feel good. Um, and that's what I'm paying for, feeling good. <laughs> that's what Barbara do, uh, make people look good and feel good. Mm -hmm. So getting still on the same line of thoughts about barbers, mm -hmm. a barber work, uh, rent a chain, a place, right? Yeah. And... Barber doesn't have W-2s. They have 1099. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes barber receive most under the table, like in cash. How a barber can invest in real estate? Real estate? So barbers are similar to realtors because they're both 1099s. They both are essentially around their own business and they have their expenses, right? Like I mentioned before. Uh, there's multiple ways you can invest in real estate without having showing any income or without having money. Um, first one that comes to mind is called a DSCR loan. Uh, DSCR, DSCR loan basically is the if the property covers in rental the mortgage, they'll give you the loan. So, for example, you find the property two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred thousand, and the rent is two thousand, and your mortgage, your debt service is uh, 1500 1800 they'll give you a loan based off of that number. Uh, so they'll use the property's income as your income. 
and then you'll be able to buy a property that way. Another way is seller financing, which is it's hard to find because sellers they want to they want to cash out. If they're selling a property, they want to just get their capital, move on to the next one. They don't really want to hold a loan. But if you find old sellers who just want to continue having their passive income, but also capitalize on not having to deal with the property or the tenants or the, or anything, they'll do seller financing. And how that works is basically you give them a down payment um, and they'll just originate the loan. They'll write a, a loan, a note for you. The title company would will, will store it, will file it, and you just pay them whatever you agreed with them, the terms, for example, um, I'm paying you, a seller, um, $1,500 a month for X amount of years, and I'll take care of the property, I'll deal with it, whatever. And when you're done with that, it's yours, you know. There's a th third one, you said? Uh, it's just, a, I mean, the traditional way, or you join uh, joint ventures, uh, basically where you put in your sweat equity. Um, the sweat equity is basically you find the property, you put in all the work, you deal with the tenants, you do all this, you do the work in the property, maintenance, and you find someone as an investor who just to dish out the capital. And they buy the property and you guys, for example, you can start off really small. You can have a, a position in equity, like five, 10%, and you'll manage the property. And then five, year later, five years later, after you finish um, adding value to the property, for example, like doing renovations, uh, raising the rent, Five years later, uh, when that property appreciated 10x, you will get 10% of that equity. So if you bought it for 100 grand and now 10 years later or five years later is a million or whatever, I know that's a pretty far-fetched number, um, you, turn, you turn your $10,000 equity to $100,000. Well, yeah. what is the process? I know you don't have to go deep in that, but mm -hmm. what is the process between buying a house or if I'm a barber, mm -hmm. I want to buy the building that I work at, that I have mm -hmm. my shop, the shop mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference? What, what I mean, what is the process and differences in between? So when you deal with commercial, you deal with numbers, you deal with um, net operating income, you deal with cash flow. Does the property produce enough income to support the mortgage? When you deal with a single family home, uh, like a primary residence, you're dealing with your personal income. Um, this is not a business, so they're not going off of the building's number or the property's number. So you would have to go the traditional route. Either you get an FHA loan, which is you know a loan that you put three and a half percent down, or you get a conventional, where it's between five to twenty percent down. So an FHA is more flexible because you can have a very low uh, a very low credit score. Um, you can also have a higher debt to income ratio, meaning. You can have 50% debt and 50% income. Um, and also, it's a lot more accessible for someone to access, especially when someone doesn't have a good credit or they have high, a lot of debt and um, okay income. Uh, the conventional route is the more the traditional route that people should go after because it's, it's, a, it's a better offer when you're submitting an offer and you, and you submit one with a conventional loan. Um, Sellers and realtors are going to uh, uh, want that one more than FHA because obviously FHA, like I mentioned, you have lower credit, you have higher debt, so it's not as uh, attractive as a conventional loan where you have to have higher credit, uh, more down payment. So you seem like a stronger buyer when you're conventional route. Can you explain what's happening in the market right now? Uh, it's so crazy. People are buying like crazy, but for who's selling, the houses are pretty much the price is very pricey. Yeah, so it depends on which side you're on. If if you're a buyer, the market sucks. <laughs> That's good. If you're a seller, the market's on fire, right? So it depends on who you are. If you're a buyer, you have to be aggressive. You're going to be waiving inspection period. You're going to be waiving appraisal. And what I mean by that is the inspection is the time frame you have to do an inspection on the property and you have the t and that's the time frame you have to cancel if you don't like what's going on or negotiate uh uh, credits. Um, if if you waive that, you can still do an inspection, but you can't cancel. You're locked in. The second thing is the appraisal. If you're buying, if you make an offer, you have to definitely go over asking price nowadays. Uh, for example, my client, I just showed them a property yesterday. It was five ninety five, and we made an offer thirty five thousand dollars over asking, and we still got beat out because someone offered six fifty cash. How much is that? Triple? Six fifty cash. Uh, that's well, that's almost sixty thousand, sixty-five thousand dollars over the list price, and they're paying cash. Um, if you waive the appraisal contingency, 
that means if the property, the 595 property appraised at 570 and you made an offer for 625, you're paying that gap out of pocket from 570 to 625. Uh, so you're coming out of pocket um, $55,000. And most cases, people don't have that money just sitting around, just overpay for a property. The reason why people are overpaying for properties right now is because there's low inventory and the demand is so high that people are getting desperate and they feel like, why rent when I can pay for my own mortgage? And even rental prices are super, super, super high. high. Uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, waiving the, con- the appraisal contingency, contingency is very dangerous. People are still doing it. Waiving inspection, people are still doing it. Some people are even writing offers cash, but they're getting a loan. You can do that, but it's risky because you're still obligated to buy the property if you get denied a loan. I yeah. don't. Um, I have a question. Don't you think it's dangerous people paying way more than the actually how the actual value of the house? If it's worth five hundred, it's valued in five hundred. You're offering six hundred just to go there and get the deal. Mm-hmm. Don't you think this is dangerous? There's there's always a, a level of risk when you buy something, even if it's an asset like real estate. Um, yes, in regards to buy, to buying something more than what it's worth, it's never a good financial decision. Uh, depends on your situation. If you're buying it for investment purposes, like I have a lot of clients who buy Airbnbs, uh, that property would yield them uh, seven to ten thousand dollars a month on Airbnb, uh, and their mortgage would be around four thousand, five thousand. So they're going to be making two to two to five grand profit. Uh, so it makes sense for them to overpay. If you're buying for a personal uh, personal residence, a primary residence. Depends how long you're gonna live in it, right? If you live in it for more than five, ten years, then it doesn't really matter, right? Because the appreciation is gonna catch up, catch up to your purchase price eventually. Uh, if you're buying it for, you know, for something temporary like two years or one year, or you're just shopping around for for work because you got relocated, I would rent. I would rent. I have another question. Who uh, who are these people buying these expensive homes cash? Are they first time? homeowners or are they investors who are buying these properties with these crazy offers majority of them are investors not first-time homeowners if, if it's a first-time homeowner they probably got an inheritance won the lotto or using their their money from COVID 19 you know the eidl and ppp loans for the wrong reasons um, or maybe crypto investors you know you never know people uh people make a lot of money in the stock market last couple of years and also in crypto so it could be their first property that they're buying, but the majority are investors who are savvy. Obviously, they're going to spend a lot. Of, they're spending a lot of money because they know what they're doing, and um, a lot of them are just parking their money in different states, like Florida's uh, no-income no-income state tax here. So, if you're in New York or in California, you want to park your money where you can get the most bang for your buck. What is this no-income tax state? What does it mean? So basically, uh, you're not taxed on your income. For example, like in California, you're you're heavily taxed. It's almost like 50% income state tax over there. Over here, it's you can pretty much write it off. Cool. So we're we're pro we're we're a red state. So we're business we're pro business. Um, so a lot of people who are coming from New York, from California, from Canada, from Chicago, they have all this money that they made um, and that they have to be investing in parking. But how a barber can compete with those investors? Let's say I'm a barber, I'm making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, and I want to buy my first house. How can I compete with these big sharks coming and buying all the homes? Um, if you have the the time and the power and the situation to wait to see if the market cools down. So I was thinking about this the other day, and the current real estate market and where I think it's heading in the next two years. Uh, The first one right now is interest rates that people have to look at, right? The Federal Reserve has been pushing aside, raising interest rates for a few years now. Uh, But with inflation being so high, they need to figure out a way to cool the market down, right? So in March, they announced that they're going to be raising interest rates about six to seven times this year. Uh, they, if you're in the market right now, if you're watching this and you're in the market right now, you're already, you're already experiencing this. Your rate went from like 4% to 5.5% overnight. And that's actually hurting people. They thought they can afford one thing. And for example, they're looking at 500000 or 400000 And now with their rate being bumped up so high, that, that pre-approval that they had, they can't afford it anymore. They have to drop down in price, right? So I think that the, the second thing is, with higher interest rates, you're going to have less mortgage applications. 
with less mortgage applications, that means less buyers in the market. And the decrease in buyers in the market, you're going to have more inventory pop up. When more inventory pops up, like more properties for sale, you're going to have sellers competing in price. So that's when I'll start seeing, or when everyone will start seeing, a stabilization in price. And you'll have a less you have less competition with buyers if you're still in the market. I think that's the best time to buy when more inventory pops up. But the, the catch is you're going to be paying more in interest as well. So if you can handle that, because interest rate really matters if you're looking at a 30 year mortgage, but interest rates doesn't really matter if you're looking at, you know, if you're going to be in the property for five years, right? You know, you're not paying the entire, you know, $400,000 that the amortization says at the end of the 30 year loan, you're actually just paying an, a, a small amount of the interest over that five period, uh, five year period. So um, sellers are going to get a FOMO, they're going to have FOMO, and they're going to start putting their houses on the market because they don't want to miss out on this hot market. And you're going to start more inventory pop up, I think it's going to happen this year. Um, and I think that would be the best time for you to jump on something if you haven't already. So to, com to answer your question to compete, you can't compete unless you change or compromise on your on what you're looking for. If you're being unrealistic and you want something, if you usually when you want something, someone else wants that too. And you're not the only person in this world, so you know you don't know other people have different uh, financial situations. If you can't if you're having if you're not having trouble if you're having trouble finding something that you like uh, and you and you are placing offers and you're not winning, either change your realtor, I'm oh, just kidding. <laughs> or you know change your terms be more aggressive or look somewhere else somewhere that you know was a plan b or plan c and compromise that way great explanation look from time to time uh, i see depressions mm -hmm. right so those people they are buying for this amount of price that's out out outrageous what you saying pricing in buying a house or a property right now uh like happened in 2008 so from time to time, there's a depression. You think there's a, a depression on the corner? You mean recession? Coming? A re depression. Oh, recession. <laughs> recession? Yeah. They well, keep saying I don't think we're going to have a great depression so. like 1929. <laughs> yeah, it's recession. Recession. Uh, recession is a, is, a, is a possibility. Recession. Uh, I would not rule that out. There are a lot of talks about recession. And data, the economical data that we receive and that we hear and that we read on CNBC and any of the articles, it, there's a lag period of three to six months. So we won't know that we're in a recession in, in six, until six months, uh, until we hit that six month mark. So for example, we can be a recession right now, but we won't, we won't know until June. Oh. Or we can be in a recession in June, but we won't know until December. Uh, and if we are in a recession, I think we won't be in a recession like we were during the housing market in 2008 because that was that was a housing market that we had because of the mortgage, the mortgages at that time. They were they were giving mortgages to everybody. You know, they were giving mortgages to people who had no income, no credit. I remember. And people were buying properties left and right. Um, and that collapsed. And that was just trickling down to everything else in the market. And we had a recession because of that. Um, and then right now we won't have a housing market crash. Uh, we'll have stabilization, I believe, where the property values are going to be maybe taking a little dip, but I don't think it's going to be a, a dip where it's going to be that much more helpful. And I think we need that because we need things to cool down. Uh, we need people to stop going crazy. The whole reason why people were coming down here is because the whole mandates and the COVID-19 and, you know, they felt like, one, they don't want to deal with the mandates in other states like California and New York. Um, there was people going crazy over there. People were moving out. Um, and secondly, uh, people just started to, to realize that there was so much more opportunity in Florida um, with the with tax situation, et cetera. So I think that uh, to answer your question, um, that this is the perfect time to, to be investing um, in real estate in South Florida, if you're looking for something that's going to benefit you in the future, for sure. Great. Yeah. What about if there's another recession like 2008 as a realtor? Mm -hmm. What do you, you would do to like keep keeping up with uh, like making still making money to survive, or who already already bought a house or a property at this time? Mm -hmm. What do you suggest? 
So two sides. Yeah. So first of all, if you're in a recession and, and as a 1099 employee, you know, what you bring in is very important. It's gonna, that's how you're going to survive. I would pivot um, and do things that you weren't doing before, even if you have to take a hit in your pride or take a hit in your income. Um, you have to survive. It's, you have to be on survival mode. You have to be prepared for that. Being resilient, right? Yeah, resilient, relentless, have grit. Um, t don't take no for an answer. And as a realtor, um, if you're not doing rentals because the time it takes to do rentals and the amount of money you make from it is not worth your time, um, you're gonna have to start doing rent, real uh, rentals again. Oh, cool. And be and be cool with that because that's supplying, that's paying for your expenses. Um, and and rentals are good. I started with rentals, you know, and rentals renters turned into home purchases and home sales and you know referrals, which is the biggest part of my business is referrals from other clients. Um, yeah. And, you know, if you have your own company, if you opened up your own shop and it started to re your traffic started to reduce, people started losing their job, be OK with downsizing because it's part of life. Everybody downsizes, you know, at some point in their life, if it's downsizing to from a nicer car to a, a, a lesser valuable car or a bigger house to a smaller car. Or if you uh, have two cars, get only one. And one wife to two wives or two wives to one wife. You know? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, downsizing is part of life. You know? So I think it's normal. I think you should definitely put your pride aside and you know, take a hit, but survive. Before our chat here, mm -hmm. you told me about you're going to drop some quote that you leave it on. Okay, so yeah, there's two things that I say all the time. One thing is if one thing is if you don't ask, you don't get. That's the biggest thing. People are so afraid to ask for things because they don't want to be rejected. And rejection is such a hard thing to 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 get, you know, because rejection is a failure and you don't want to feel like you're a failure. So put your pride aside and just don't give can I curse? Yeah. Curse. Don't give a shit. Do don't give a shit what people are gonna shit, say, guys. right? <laughs> like if you're, for example, like I'm with my fiance, um, shout out to my fiance. She's a PA. She's, a, she's, she's studying to be a PA. Um, she's, she's, she's great. And she sometimes when I'm at a restaurant, I'm like, I should ask for more of this or more bread or like more, like if you're at Red Lobster, or more cheddar biscuits, right? You know, people are like, oh, don't ask. Like, you know, that's being greedy or whatever. Like, no, I'm going to ask because they're, they're probably going to give it to me. You don't know what the limit on how much cheddar biscuits I can get. So if you don't ask, you don't get. I've gotten so much business um, from asking for it because, because I follow that model, you know. Um, you lose on so much information, on knowledge, on friendships, on experience because you don't ask for it. And you have to ask a lot from yourself too. Actually, as a barber, we have so much connection mm -hmm. in the person that will help you a lot and give you some information mm -hmm. and anything else is right there in your chair. Mm -hmm. Before I was this person that I never asked because just like uh, what, I, what I can say, I was like lacking of being more to grow. But now every opportunity I make questions. So I understand their business, how they get there, how they are, why they are successful the way they are so I can, you know, strive and do the same. Absolutely. You know? I 1000% agree. What is a uh, rent? We, we were looking at the other rent to own mm -hmm. a home. What is that rent to own? So that's like an option contract. So basically, you are agreeing, you are getting into a contract with a seller uh, to to rent a space with the opportunity to own it at a later time. Oh, it was easy like that. You didn't have to explain. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So basically. So if you can find it, very rare in this market uh, to find a, a property where they would give you an option to rent and then own in the future at a future time. Um, so basically, you find that property and you give them a down payment. They hold that down payment, and you also write a contract at that time that you're going to purchase this property in X amount of years. So five or ten years later, you're going to buy the property. Uh, but you're going to pay them rent in the meantime. It doesn't go towards mortgage. It doesn't go towards anything. It just goes towards the, the seller's pocket. So, What is I, the advantage then? I love that advantage because if you can find a property like that, here's where you make, you make a good decision. 
when you find a property like that, you're locking in that price of that property. Mm-hmm. You're locking in, so for example, you find a property for 500K right now, you get into a rent to own situation, you're buying that property 10 years from now. How much do you think that property is worth 10 years from now? Less or more? 800K, 800K, 900K, wow. maybe a million. Because everything just grow, right? I mean, just- Appreciation. Yeah, appreciation the average yeah. appreciation uh, on, a, on a boring market, not in the recent markets, but the average is like three to 5%. Whoa. So one, one of the properties that my client wants to put an offer on today, uh, the sellers bought the property for 780,000. It's on the market today for 2.2. Whoa. And they bought that in 2015. Seven years later, almost triple. Wow. Pretty much triple what they bought it for. So you're locking that price today, and then you're building that equity, just paying rent. And you don't have to buy it. Say, for example, you need to start building up your credit. You need to start building up your income. You're, you have a business that you started, and you need to grow that. Rent to own, if you find a property to do that, it's very hard. <laughs> And lock in that price, lock in that price, and then five, ten years later, whatever you agree with that seller, you're buying it at ten year a price ten years ago. What if I give up? Like I do the contract, I give the down payment, I'm renting the property, but whatever happens in my life, and I don't want it anymore, what happens? You lose your deposit. Just this, yeah. just the deposit, nothing yeah. else. What so about the, credit and stuff? No, doesn't affect your credit. So what the seller loses. The seller will probably prefer that you back out because they are probably looking at the market and be like, I wish this person would just back out so I can sell it and make my profit. But they made money off of you of rental, you know, uh, off the rental income that they received from you. And if you back out, maybe if the seller is okay with it, they'll probably just give you your deposit back because they can probably make more money selling the property. So you can always negotiate that at the end. So it depends if the market's down, Mm-hmm. Then they're and you want to back out. Well, you can either extend the contract, hopefully, if they agree. If they don't want to extend the contract, then you would either buy the property if it's underwater um, or uh, lose your deposit. Is it possible to buy a commercial property if you don't own a house? Yes. I just start like my first time buying a property is a commercial property. Mm-hmm. And how does it work to prove like collateral? They always ask for collateral to finance. Can I just start investing in commercial properties and not homes? Yeah. So the the reason why they ask for they they ask for a couple things. For example, uh, your experience. Have you owned any commercial properties, investment properties, any properties? Um, if you don't do that, then they try to look at the property itself that you're buying to see if it's worth it for them to risk. Um, giving you a loan for it. So they would use that as collateral in most cases. Um, depends on who the lender is. There's some lenders that would be more risky. There's some lenders that want to be more conservative. If you go to a traditional bank, they're the most conservative conservative that you can get. If you go to a credit union, they want to build a relationship with you. So they're probably going to want to give you the loan. Um, and they'll try to work with you on that point. And they probably won't give you a jumbo loan and give you $5 million, but they'll probably you know, s- tell you to start with a small property, you know, start with a multifamily, a duplex, a fourplex, um, and go from there. And I think that's what everybody should do is start small, get experience, and then take it to the bank. Like, hey, listen, I own this duplex. Like, what can I do next? Can I jump to a fourplex or a fiveplex? If I want to buy, let's say we have a barber shop and then mm-hmm. we rent the space. If I want to buy, it's a plaza. It's not like single units that they sell individually. Mm -hmm. Um, Having the business there and having cash flow and whatever, is it easier for me to buy if I don't have, for instance, a home that I could use as a collateral? Um, If you have a business, they can also give you a business loan uh, and they can also give you a loan based off of the income if you're buying it from the business. So if you're buying the property from your business, if your business is on the mortgage or on the loan, they can go run off of your, your, your numbers off of that. Um, and they'll also use the numbers in the building, in the commercial property. So if you have other suites rented already, you have occupancy, they're going to use all that income to supplement your income to be able to use it as collateral to, to, to supply you with the loan. So it's good to find properties that have occupancy. Um, the client that I went to, uh, my friend who owns that health insurance agency, um, he and his partners are looking for a commercial building. Uh, and the commercial building we recently just looked at, 
the property was making net operating income $250,000 a year. So after all expenses, they're, they're, it was profiting 250000 So they can move their office in there and essentially have it all for free and make money on top of their business, make money off of the building. And on top of that, you have appreciation. Your building is appreciating in value. So the appreciation is the best thing that you can have, is the value of your asset on top of the money that you're making on the asset. So would you say it's a good move if I have a business and if it's feasible that I could buy that property where my business is mm -hmm. instead of paying rent? Do you think it's a good deal? It's a good investment? 1,000%. Yep. That is Amazing. the next move for you guys. I think you guys should definitely think buy it, right? buy it, you know, buy it or, you know, rent to own it, whatever you can. If it's a private uh, commercial property, uh, try to work out a deal with the seller. Try to see, like, listen, um, do you want to continue to get rent? You don't want to manage this anymore, right? I know it's a pain in the ass trying to collect rents and stuff. Let me take it off your hands. I'll pay you what you would close to what you were getting or or more if it makes sense for you financially and let me buy this property from you uh, maybe do seller financing where they hold the note and they continue to get paid off of it but they don't have to deal with any of the maintenance they don't have to deal with any of the headaches That's amazing yeah thank you yeah wow no <laughs> what are, we have a future pro, pro, uh, project that is huge and the investment it's a lot of money mm -hmm. uh would you recommend buying the building or rent no let me clarify because mm -hmm. your question he won't be able to get all the points so let's say if you want to start a business or open a second third business whatever that requires a lot of investment in that property right a lot of renovations you're gonna put so much money in that property does it make sense to buy the property instead of renting because you're gonna put so much investment and then if you have let's say a 10-year lease and that lease ends you put so much money there to renovate to build the place what's your suggestion so it depends on your situation if you have capital to do that um if you have capital regardless i would first consider buying it if you can't buy it then negotiate with the the owner and try to get the build out so negotiate a build out with them so for example if i sign a five to ten year lease with you you guys will agree to invest and build out my space so do you know do you get what i'm saying yes so say you're the owner of the building and i'm leasing one of your spaces if you want to lock me in for 10 years i'd like for you to build out my barbershop build close uh, open up the wall run the plumbing the electrical and i'll just buy the chairs and the, and the mirrors and the artwork whatever um, and that way it's a partnership where you didn't really invest in the build out you invested just in renting the space and you locked in your your uh, your rental that is there is there realistic find that person yeah my cousin did it wow yeah my, they mm. they recently did and the, i think what helped them out was that they found the lease during covid mm -hmm. and they were negotiating during covid and that was like the the hit the commercial spaces took a hit yes so i felt like they were a little bit more lenient on uh working with them how does big companies let's say walgreens walmart how do they do because usually they mcdonald's for instance whatever mm -hmm. they have this build out that they have to build their space in a specific way mm -hmm. what type of deals they usually get with the landlord they rent the land how does it work uh, so for example mcdonald's right they're big on purchasing the land that they that they have their property in Uh, for CVS and Walgreens, they, they lease out the land and they usually have long term leases. So the land owner loves that because it's, it locks them in and they have that, that security. Uh, and you know, CVS and Walgreens are always going to pay, right? It's always going to be an essential business. So when you own a piece of land that has a structure or a land that someone wants to build a structure on, you lease that land, lease it to Walgreens and CVS. And usually these commercial leases have structures where they go up in rent a certain X amount every single year. So they're going to be making what they plan to make um, for 30 years, for example. It's a longer term lease than any other traditional things um, like a barbershop or an insurance company or a real estate company. So it's a lot. The security is there. Anything else, babe? No. That's Amazing conversation here, man. I learned a lot. 
actually for myself, mm -hmm. I learned a lot. And I think, I guess, all the uh, audience that are learning too. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gene, thank you very much for coming out. But can you share your Instagram? Yeah, so my Instagram is my name, Gene C. Tavares, um, an Instagram. So it's at J-E-A-N-C-T-A-V-E-R-A-S. Um, you can also find me on my website, luxolas.com. That's L-U-X-O-L-A-S.com. There's a lot of information in there. You can search for properties, et cetera. If you have any questions um, on real estate investing, or if you just wanted to chat it up and talk life, wisdom, whatever, hit me up for any reason. You know, I'm always open to learn more. I'm always open to expand and always open to make new friends. Man, great conversation here. Guys, uh, Gene, again, thank you very much for coming out, man. You took your time and thank you. I appreciate so much you came. Thank you for the black, thank for coming to the Black Bell Barber podcast. No, thank you. And also, guys, follow me to Invictus, and we're going to be launching this soon. Awesome, awesome. And I don't know if you're stopping it or what, but um, the second quote, since I didn't answer that one, right? The only limits in life are the ones set forth by your own reality. And what I mean by that is your perception on yourself is huge because if you perceive that your reality is what you have now is what is all you're going to get though that's your limit but if you expand your reality your perception is going to expand with it so your limit in life is based off of your reality expand your reality make your reality um, what you want it to be and you'll achieve that great no yeah. perfect <laughs> Guys, thank you for watching again the Black Belt Barber podcast, the first and only podcast about entrepreneurship for barbers. We bring relevant people to the table to add up to all, all single person that are watching us. Please, guys, give it a like and share. By sharing this video, uh, the YouTube understand that is relevant content will help more people that are watching. Thank you very much.